Hello and uh, welcome one and all. Today we will cover the fundamentals of structure query language, commonly known as SQL. Previously, we have set up a SQL Server environment. We have installed SQL Server Express, Management Studio, and restored the AdventureWorks database. If you need to set up an environment, then check out this video. I'll leave the link in the description below. Once your environment is ready, then let's learn and practice SQL or Structure Query Language. Today we'll cover the basics by querying the AdventureWorks database. Few basic things to cover before we get started. SQL Server is the backend database and Management Studio or SSMS as it is commonly referred to is the relational database management system. We interact with the backend database engine using SSMS. We will begin with the fundamentals of SQL prior to jumping into writing SQL queries. We will explore the entity relationship diagram of the database and go over the logical query processing first. These are the fundamental skills to have in writing efficient SQL queries. Once we get the basics right, then we can build on it to solve more complex problems. SQL is quite different from other programming languages. And we will see this during the logical query processing. I will list and break down the steps involved in the logical query processing. And if you think you know how a SQL query is processed, then number each question mark in order in which it should be executed by looking at the query on your screen. I'll leave this up for a few seconds. To be honest, it took me a while to get this right. One hint, SQL is not processed in the order in which it is written. So we have a SELECT clause, or within SELECT we can have a DISTINCT or TOP END clause. And then the column selection. What order do you think the SELECT clause is processed? 1, 2, and this is followed by the FROM clause. What order should the FROM clause have? And within the FROM clause, we can have JOIN. In the JOIN we have an ON clause. And after that we can have APPLY, PIVOT, UNPIVOT, and so on. So what order? do these have in the query processing? And then we have the WHERE clause. What number should the WHERE clause and GROUP BY clause have? We are left with HAVING and ORDER BY clause. Do you think the ORDER BY is the last or is it the HAVING clause? If you're done ordering the SQL clauses and quite certain on your choices, then let's go over them. First thing you might notice is that SQL is not processed in the order which it is written. The first clause that is processed is the FROM clause, while the SELECT clause, which appears first, is processed almost last. Did you get the order right? This was a surprise for me too, after a few years of working with SQL. And another shocking revelation, each step generates a virtual table that is used as the input for the following step. However, as users, we only see the final table that is returned as a result. So let's go over these steps. Step 1 identifies the query source tables and processes table operators. Each table operator applies a series of subphases. For example, there are multiple phases in from clause. First is the join. Let's call it 1A. The from phase generates a virtual table. Let's call it T1. This is followed by on clause which filters the rows from T1 table based on the predicate that appears in the on clause. Only rows for which the predicate evaluates to true are inserted into the next table, let's call that T2. Then we have the where clause. This phase filters the rows from T2 virtual table based on the predicate that appears in the where clause. And only rows for which the predicate evaluates to true are inserted into the next virtual table, T3. After the where clause, we have the group by. This phase arranges the rows from T3 in group based on column list that are specified in the group by clause. And this generates another table, T4. Ultimately, there'll be one result row per group. Then we have the having clause. This phase filters the group from T4 based on the predicate that appears in the having clause. And only rows which match the filter criteria are inserted in the next table, T5. And now it's the turn of the select clause. This phase processes the elements in the SELECT clause, generating another table, T6. And then we evaluate the expression that appears in the SELECT clause. This phase evaluates the expression in the SELECT list, generating another table, let's call it T6A. And within SELECT, we can have a DISTINCT clause, 
This removes the duplicate rows from 6A, generating 6B. And we can also have a top clause. This filters the specified top number or top percentage of rows from T6B based on the logical ordering defined by the order clause, generating another table, T6C. And last in the list is the order by. This phase sorts the row from T6C according to the column list specified in the order by clause. And after this, the query generates the final table that is presented to the user. Now you're familiar with how a SQL query is processed. This will give you a mental map when you're writing your own SQL queries. With the help of logical query processing, we can write efficient SQL queries. Another helpful tool is ERD or Entity Relationship Diagram. This gives us an overview of the database entities or tables and how these tables are related to each other. Let's focus on products tables. We can see that we have three tables relating to products. Product details are in dim product table. This table defines the attribute of product such as name, size, color, and price. These product roll up to a product subcategory and then a category. And these are spread across two different tables. The lines between them, known as crow's foot notation, represent the relationship between tables. This is the many side of the relationship and this is the one side of the relationship. This means one row of dim product category is related to many rows of dim product subcategory. You can read more about crow's foot notation here. I'll leave the link in the description below. Product tables are what we call a dimension. A dimension table is a collection of reference information about a measurable event. Dimension tables provide context and label information for our measurable sales values stored in another type of table called fact. And in this example, fact internet sales table is a fact table. It contains all the sales transaction. But without the dimension table, fact table values would not make any sense. Our dim product table has a relationship to the fact table, fact internet sales. So we can join these tables and get sales amount at product level. I hope this makes sense. ERD diagram helps us see the relationship that exists between tables. This will come in handy when we need to define joins between tables in our queries. I think this is a good time to jump into the actual SQL. Let's begin writing SQL with few simple queries to look at customer's data. I'll present scenario based questions and we'll write a query to answer the questions. Suppose we are asked to provide customer's information to our client relation manager. So the task prompt is, write a SQL query that retrieves data for all customers. Okay, we have our first task and we need to extract customer data. First question, where is this data stored? Is everything stored in a single table? If not, how do we find out the related tables to customers? Well, you can ask a fellow developer who has been working at the company for a while or ask for an ERD. Let's head back to our ERD diagram of AdventureWorks we can see that we have a dim customer table. It joins to fact internet sales and dim geography table. Geography table in turn joins to dim sales territory table. However, the customer information is in a single table, but customer geography details are spread across multiple tables. If you need sales territory or region, then we would need to join the dim sales territory table as well. Other customer attributes such as zip code and state and country information is in geography table. So we would need to join these tables to get full picture of a customer. Okay, back in management studio, we will query the dim customer table. First clause in SQL is select. After select, we need to specify the columns we want. If we want to select everything, then we can use asterisk. I'll specify top 20 since we only want to see what's inside this table. If you're working with a large table and especially beyond development environment, then don't issue an open select statement without any filters against a large table. You will end up blocking other queries running in those environments. So to preview a sample of table, we can use top end to preview the data. After asterisk, we write the from clause, then our schema, which is DBO in this case. Schema is a method to group related tables together in a database. If you have a large database, then you may see multiple schemas. After schema is our table name, dim customer. Our query is ready. Let's execute it. There are two ways to execute a query. 
we have an execute button on the top ribbon or we can use the F5 key on the keyboard. This returns an error. If your SQL query has a syntax error, it'll be printed down here. This error tells us that this table does not exist. Either we have misspelled the table name or we are not in the right database. You can tell by looking at the dropdown that we are in the master database. So this table does not exist in the context of master database. So to fix this, we can either select the AdventureWorks database from here, or we can write a use statement on top of our query. I'll write a use statement so it will select the database first, then execute our query. Okay, this time our query executed successfully. And we can see the top 20 rows from the customer table. We see the customer detail, for example, their name, date of birth, contact detail, marital status, income, education, whether they own a house or not. We have all sorts of detail about a customer here. So the logical query order would be, first we select the table, then the select clause comes in, and then we restrict the rows to top 20, then select all the columns. This is a good map to have while you're writing your SQL queries. We can remove the top end clause and run the query again. This is our customer information data and we have selected all the customer attributes. We are ready to send this data over to our client relation manager. We can copy this in Excel and hand it over to the end user. Okay, great work. We have completed the first task and delivered the data successfully to the end user. We have a follow up from the user. He doesn't want all the data. He's only interested in certain customer attributes. He wants customer name that includes the title, first name, middle name, if any, last name, suffix of all customer, plus their contact information and, and income detail. So now we will select columns that contains this information. We will type in the column names after the select and each column is separated with a comma. I'll go ahead and quickly select all the columns that contains this information. Okay, the query looks ready. Let's execute it. Our data set looks great. And this is what user has asked for. We package this in Excel and send it over again. This time around, we get a positive feedback, but with few more tweaks. He asked us to combine the title, first name and last name into a single column. Also, he doesn't understand what the nulls are in the Excel spreadsheet. So he asked us to either remove those or handle the, these values. And he is only interested in customers who are house owners. Okay, let's update our query to match the new requirements. We can combine two columns with plus symbol or a pipe symbol. Whatever you choose, be consistent. I'll use the plus symbol after the title and then add single quotes with one space to give space between title and first name. We can repeat this for the last name as well. Then we give this column a name. We can alias a column with as keyword and after it, we can provide the column name. Let's call it customer name. We have the null values in the title. So for this, we can use the coalesce function and provide a default value whenever we encounter a null value. I'll provide a space so it'll be blank whenever the value in the title column is null. Last thing, we need to restrict this data for a customer who own a house. We have house owner flag column. It has two values, zero and one. One means house owner. So we need to restrict this data to where the house owner flag is one. Let's utilize the SQL where clause to filter this data set. So after our from clause, let's write the keyword where and then the column, which is the house owner flag, and set this equal to one. Okay, let's go ahead and run this query and check our result. Our row count dropped from 18,000 to 12,000, so the filter took effect. Let's examine the house owner flag column to check if all the values are one. This looks great. Now we can send the updated data to our client. And I think I'll stop here for this session. We will carry on from here in the next. In the meantime, I'll leave you with few practice questions to help you hone your SQL skills. Check the description of the video for the practice question. Let me know if you run into any issues in the comments below. This is all for now. Like, share and subscribe. Take care and I'll see you in the next video.